and we'll, we'll talk about them. Uh, so today we, we move to the, uh, the uh, center of the argument of the Magdeburgian uh, pastors. And uh, we left off with this scene, which is a, uh, this is a, an engraving, a colored engraving of uh, Magdeburg. Of course, there were no cameras then, so you had artists who would draw uh, pictures. And this is a, a scene when the uh, army was trying to take an intermediate fortress in the river that guarded the approach to, to Magdeburg. Uh, you remember from last week, Charles V is, at the time, the, the emperor of the, the widest stretching empire ever. It includes both uh, Europe and uh, the Americas and uh, parts of Asia. And it's, I mean, it's a truly world-spanning empire. And uh, huge amounts of silver are flooding back into uh, Spain to fund enormous armies. And Magdeburg is surrounded by more soldiers than it has people. Magdeburg itself is a relatively small town. It, it's important we remember it because it's the last town. Everyone else has either defeated, uh, been defeated in, in battle, been captured, uh, or they've given up. They've, they've agreed to go along with the Augsburg interim, which was the, the terms of, of the truce that Charles offered was if you would submit to the Roman Catholic Church on these terms, uh, then we'll let you have peace. And so many people have given up the battle, and lonely Magdeburg stands alone, uh, surrounded by all the armies that had previously conquered everybody else in Germany. And they make the decision to continue resisting. It's a decision that God blessed. Uh, as it happens, about a year into the siege, the siege of the town went on for a year, roughly, and then the siege was lifted by outside threats uh, to Charles V. Uh, but today uh, we, we, uh, we continue on. Last week we, we focused on the, the sort of constant sense of Christians who know the prophecies in uh, Daniel, that there will be a, a kingdom that the church is resisting until the end. The, the kingdom of God will slowly beat down the last of the great world empires. Uh, and of course we saw in, in Revelation, this is talked about in terms of the church's resistance to Antichrist. But you can put this in other terms. Uh, Paul talks about it, that, that we should uh, understand that we're in a certain kind of antithesis with the world. That if you understand yourself as a Christian as just a part of the world, you misunderstand yourself. You're in antithesis with the world. You shouldn't be conforming yourself to the world. You should be uh, being transformed. And so uh, another way to put this in, in, in terms that these pastors use is, the Bible tells us that there will be powers that try to lead people away from God, powers that try to establish false worship, that there will be a, an overlap of false worship, false morals, and political power, and that in, in uh, the experience of a Christian, we ought to be wary, we ought to be aware of being misled by those, by those powers. And that's certainly true. I, I mean, if you want to know my judgment on the matter, it's certainly in the Bible. Uh, the Magdeburgian pastors certainly teach it. There are many ways of understanding the antithesis we should have with the world, but one of the ways the Bible teaches it to us is with the, the, the power of a kingdom that unites false religion and political, political power. So their theory of resistance grows out of this sense of antithesis, uh, but it's also a, a, a sense of, of resistance that's justified by a, a claim about Christian morality. And that's what I want to turn to today. Uh, up here, I've, I've begun, we've already talked about the Ciceronian theory of, of resistance. And uh, Ciceronian resistance, you'll recall, uh, was a very quick form of resistance. Wherever you find tyranny, wherever you find a ruler who acts for his own purposes rather than for the good of the state, you have a tyrant, and his actions are null, he has left the authority of his office, and you can resist him immediately. Um, in fact, um, you, you are encouraged to resist him. 
Uh, Cicero puts it that, that one who does this is worse than the worst of the beasts. He should be killed like a, a mad dog. He should be killed like a, a tiger that's loose. He should be killed because he's the greatest danger to, to society. And uh, resistance is uh, appropriate to a tyrant immediately. In fact, uh, the, the, the Roman doctrine and the Greek doctrine was that you should kill someone who even intends to become a tyrant. If you know that someone intends to become a tyrant, you should kill them. Before they've become a tyrant, it's appropriate to, to kill them in anticipation once you know of their, of their intent. The theory of resistance that we see from the pastors at Magdeburg is very different. And it's different with respect to, uh, with respect to two different uh, dimensions. First off, who? Who can resist? And secondly, the occasions of resistance. What has to happen before you can resist? So with respect to who, the Ciceronian view is anybody can. Everybody should. Everybody has a duty to take up a knife and to kill the tyrant if he can. It's a universal duty of uh, resistance. The theory that we see in our reading today is very different. It says the, the only people who can, can rule and effectively resist are people who are called to it by God because they've been made magistrates already. They'll either be the superior of the magistrate who's acting unjustly, they'll be his equal, they'll be his inferior, an inferior magistrate. That's why this theory is some kind of, sometimes called the doctrine of lesser magistrates, because everybody seems to agree that a superior magistrate has a duty to stop the injustice of an inferior. But what's special about the theory is the insistence that inferior magistrates have an obligation to uh, and right to resist superior magistrates. And they also talk about magistrates who have been deposed and replaced with unjust magistrates. They retain their, their office and their ability as inferior magistrates to, to resist. So this is a, a basic distinction. The Ciceronian theory, who can resist? Anyone who has the power. Everyone. Anyone who can stick a, a dagger in the, in the tyrant uh, may do so. Um, everyone can. In fact, everyone has an obligation. When? Immediately. You can resist as, as soon as there is injustice. We, we've seen some of this today uh, in a popular uh, theory of, of resistance that's offered in the United States, that everyone has a duty to disobey unjust laws right away. If it's an unjust law, you have a duty to disobey it. The occasions when resistance is appropriate, according to the, uh, the pastors of Magdeburg, uh, is much more limited. So they say, in general, resistance is impermissible. The general rule is you can't resist, even injustices. There's a whole class of injustices that they say arises from the unavoidable sinfulness of man, that uh, mankind is sinful, and there are all sorts of errors, uh, sins that rulers are going to commit in the course of being human and administering uh, the state. And those sort of ordinary things that inevitably arise from sin, human limitation, we have to suffer, suffer through those. We are permitted, they say, permitted, not required, permitted uh, to resist if there is tyranny. And what they mean by tyranny is some clear, open, notorious act in violation of the laws, uh, something that is so outwardly indisputable that it, it bespeaks of, a, of no other possibility uh, other than the desire of the, of the ruler to, to reduce the people. They also sometimes suggest that the distinction in part should hinge on whether or not there's a remedy. If the, if the ruler does something that is remediable, if it could be remedied in some way, that weighs heavily against considering it an occasion for injustice. 
So the openness, the, the notoriousness, the apparent nature of the wrong is very important. You, you shouldn't jump to uh, resist unless the, the nature of the, of the wrongful conduct you're sure is clear to the ruler and clear to you and doesn't arise from the common failings, the common sinfulness of, of man. Resistance is only required according to these people. It's required in all cases according to Cicero. It's only required according to these people when you are forced to participate in the tyranny. So the example that's given is the Egyptian midwives. Pharaoh says to the Egyptian midwives, uh, I want you to participate, you personally, to participate in my tyranny. Uh, at that point, you have an obligation to resist. You, you, you can't go along with it. If, 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 if non-resistance would involve you in the crime, you obviously have an ob ob obligation to, to resist, they say. Why? Well, because I have to follow God's law, not man's. I, I must, in that case, vindicate my separateness, my separation from the, the ruler. That's the only time I have an obligation to resist. Otherwise, I'm weighing and I'm balancing. I'm thinking about whether it's easier for me to suffer, whether it's more appropriate for me to suffer a loss of property, even a loss of life. I'm weighing and balancing many kinds of considerations up to the point where I would be involving myself in wrongdoing, at which point I, I, I'm required to resist. And then they have a final third category. Uh, and this, as I said, their, their theory grows out of a sense. Why did they resist such incredible odds? Because they had a sense that they were resisting not a man, not an action, but they were resisting the Antichrist. That is to say, they were resisting the, uh, a very personal embodiment of the forces that tried to use false religion and political power to lead Christians away from the truth, to lead mankind away from the truth. They, they talk about this category. They say, there's another kind of tyrant who's more than a tyrant, and we certainly have to resist him. This is a category they get from Luther, by the way. Uh, Luther called him the, the, the werewolf or the bugbear, kind of a werebear. But werebear doesn't sound very scary in English. Werebear sounds like it should be on my T-shirt, right? But it, it, it's a, look, it's happy werebear. Everybody applaud for happy werebear. No, it's not like that. It's a kind of, it's a, a horrible monster. And the idea is that this kind of tyrant is not just making war on, on the rights of man. He's not making war on your rights. He's not making war on this person's right or that person's right. He's not taking this person's property or this person's life. His goal is to upend and to erase mankind's whole conception of God's promise, God's command, God's order. He's trying to invert uh, God's order in the world. He's trying to set up an inverted kingdom where what is, what is unjust is, is taught to people as just. He's trying to use false religion. He's trying to use political power uh, to subvert men's minds so that they invert and lose track of what is right and what is wrong. It's a war not on this right or that right. It's a war on right itself. And this is very, this idea is startlingly familiar to us because this is, of course, what totalitarian societies in the 20th century did all the time. Is they, they didn't just take people's property, they didn't just take people's lives. They taught people, they indoctrinated people so that they would believe that this is truth, justice, and right. They, they, they were fully integrated systems of education, physical control, mental control, that sought to upend man's historic belief and understanding and invert it. And chillingly, I think, the uh, example that the pastors at, at Magdeburg give, they say, of course, it's obvious that Charles is one of these creatures because he's trying to use his political power to destroy true religion. He's trying to force us to deny 
uh, that Christ's salvation is given to us, not by our own works, but by faith alone. He's trying to get us to deny that the, the foundation of truth is the scriptures. He's trying to, to tell people that in order to be a, a Christian, that you need to uh, be in subjection to a man, the Pope. Uh, he's, he is using religion, he's using his political power to change religion. But they say, but of course, this isn't the only chance this could occur. Another example would be, but they go, but this would be crazy. I mean, obviously, nobody could get away with this. Imagine if a state tried to change people's conceptions of marriage so that our contracts of marriage were more like contracts of prostitution, so that no one could really enter into permanent marriages, that uh, promiscuity was encouraged, that, that people were taught that uh, sleeping around was a good thing, uh, that prostitution was no different than any other kind of, of life, that marriage itself was deformed and put under attack. Obviously, everybody should rise up against such a kingdom. Obviously, such a kingdom would be the kingdom of the Antichrist trying to establish a kingdom of hell uh, against, against God. It's a pretty fair description of, of the time we live in, uh, frankly. We live in a time when there has been precisely an upending uh, of sexual ethics, a reversal of our understanding from the Bible of what's right and wrong in sexuality. And marriages today, uh, the state says you have a right to commit adultery. You have a right in Korea, in the United States, under the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, you have a right to have sex outside of marriage, to fornicate, to commit adultery. Uh, you have a right to leave your husband and your children for no reason whatsoever. This, this is exactly what the pastors of Magdeburg thought would be a good example of a kingdom that we should all resist as the kingdom of the, of the Antichrist. So that's a pretty chilling part of this of this uh, of this piece. All right. So those are two differences. The two main differences. Who can resist? Only, only magistrates. Only people who are already magistrates can resist other magistrates. Ciceronian view: anybody can. When can you resist? Only in certain special situations where the tyranny is especially open where there is a, 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 somebody trying to force you to participate in the wrongdoing, where the tyranny has bloomed into an outward manifestation of the Antichrist, those three, those three uh, principles. So why is there uh, this difference between the Ciceronian view and the Magdeburgian view? Well, I think, I think this text helps explain. I've, I've snipped off one part of your reading. Uh, we'll go through it. I think it helps us uh, explain it. But the basic difference is faith. The, the pastors of Magdeburg have faith in the promises of, of God and their, their interpretation of them, that God's providence is real and powerful in the world, and they believe that God has promised that he will provide magistrates for our good. So let's, let's read their, their text. But he who resists, it is necessary that he resist in his own station. And what they're, what they're talking about here, when he says station, it, they're talking about callings here. Paul says, stay in your own calling. Everybody has been given particular gifts by God, a particular calling. He says, when you become a Christian, stay in your calling. That's what they're talking about. They think that some people are called to be magistrates. Just like some people are called to be lawyers, some people are called to be doctors, some people are called to be husbands, some people are called to be wives, some people are called to be magistrates. But he who resists, it is necessary that he resist in his own station as a matter of his calling. Next, therefore, it is the calling of another magistrate, either the superior or the equal of him who inflicts the harm, or of the inferior who suffers the harm, who is himself the ordinance of God through the superior, 
to be an honor to good works and a terror to evil in his defense of his own citizens by the command of God. The, the pastors of Magdeburg are, are confident that God has given us the political provision that we need. And he's given it to us by calling certain people to be magistrates. He has made them magistrates. And until you find that guy, you can't resist. The guy who can resist is the person who has received the calling and the station of God to be a magistrate. And if you haven't found that guy yet, then you can't resist because God has put him there. He's there. We can trust the providence of God. We can have faith in him. So they do not say, absolutely not, that every man instantly has a calling from God to stab the, the tyrant, like Cicero would say. Why? Because they, uh, they believe that God has given us a political provision, that he has appointed people to be magistrates, and they look around the world and they say, look at all these people. When you see magistrates, if you find one guy doing wrong, he's not by himself. He's surrounded by a bunch of other magistrates. Who? Well, sometimes it's a superior. Sometimes there's a superior magistrate. Sometimes there's someone who's his equal. Sometimes there are magistrates who are his inferiors. This is the person doing injustice you might want to resist. Who can resist him? Only one of these people around him who God has called, who God has given the station to be a magistrate. Do we believe that such people will be there? They say, absolutely. We believe that because we believe that God has given us a, a provision, a providence uh, politically. And so we ought to look for these people and find these people. And the only person who God has given the task of punishing wrong, wrongfulness to is magistrates. So this is just a, a, another summary. The Magdeburg pastors, they derive a right of resistance from their faith in the biblical promise of Romans 13. Romans 13, they read to say that God has appointed certain people. He has given them to us as a gift. There is institution. They're part of his grace to punish wrongdoers. Then they say, if a ruler starts to act tyrannically, if he acts unjustly, not in the ways that everybody does, there are certain ways of evil that everybody, everybody falls prey to as a human being. But if he goes beyond that, if he acts in a way that's indisputably tyrannical, he's making war on the rights of given people, well, that can't be, they say, who Romans 13 is talking about. Now, this is controversial, but we'll go back to it. They say Romans 13 can only be talking about uh, people who are acting with a certain kind of justice in a non-tyrannical way. Why? Because Romans 13 says that rulers will not be, not be a source of fear to good people. Good people won't be afraid of them. Who will be afraid of them? Only unjust people. So if rulers become a terror to just people, that's not who Romans 13 is talking about. That's their theory. So once that happens, once a ruler starts acting tyrannically, then they say, well, that's not an institution of God. And thus far, Cicero would agree. Cicero wouldn't get involved with the, the question of God. He would just say, OK, once someone's acting unjustly, they're not a ruler at all. But the Magdeburgians have faith in God. Yes, it's true, they say, the former ruler can't be the authority that's appointed by God. But they say, given God's promise, indeed, given our, our constant experience of the world, there must be others appointed by God who can do this. God says, I've appointed rulers to administer justice. I've, administered, I've appointed rulers to be a terror to the wicked. So if the former ruler, who once was a ruler, has now shown himself not to be a ruler because of his injustice, you don't just get to pick up a, a, a knife and run around stabbing people. Your job then is to say, okay, now who is the ruler that God has appointed? And they say, look at the world. For any bad guy you find, he's surrounded by a cluster of other people. Those are the rulers now uh, who, in whom you should put your, your confidence. And the word to them is, the rule of Magdeburg to them is, you guys should know. You guys need to be confident 
that you have the right to resist. They, they compare people who deny them this right to those in the book of Maccabees who said you can't fight on Sunday. Do you remember that? There were a group of people in the book of Maccabees and the, the, terrible, the terrible Greeks are coming down and they want to fight on the Sabbath day. And the, some of the Jews say, I'm not going to fight on the Sabbath day. And then they all get killed. And, and they say, what you're doing when you tell a lesser magistrate that they can't resist a superior magistrate is like telling people they can't fight on the Sabbath day. It leads them all to get wiped out for no reason. So in faith, they say, if you believe Romans 13, you should keep looking. God has appointed. The whole point of Romans 13 is God has appointed these people. We see them in the world. There's not just Charles V. Uh, there are people who are around Charles V. And indeed, the Schmalkaldic League was itself a series of inferior magistrates who prepared uh, defensive forces and who ultimately launched a preemptory attack against Charles V. The Schmalkaldic League was an embodiment of this, of this theory. So look what, they're, look what they're doing. So this is an interpretation of Romans 13. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those authorities which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Okay, thus far in Romans 13, there's no suggestion that whether someone is a ruler or not depends on whether they're just or not. Rather, what, what we're saying is if you identify somebody who's an authority, if you identify somebody who's a, a ruler, he is the ordinance of God and you can't resist them. Okay? Right? All right. Well, their argument comes in on the next set of verses. For rulers are not a ca cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Well, now they say, look, okay, we're doing something really good. We're promoting true religion. We're promoting true ethics. We are being a witness of Jesus Christ in the world. And we are afraid of Charles V. Charles V is going to come in and he's going to make us do things which we know are wrong. We're afraid of him for the best thing that we can do, which is to truly and faithfully follow Jesus Christ and follow the word of God, to hold up the word of God, to, to hold up the true life of the church, to hold up Jesus Christ as our sole hope, for salvation. That's super good. But we're afraid of Charles V because of our good behavior. Well, that's the, therefore not the rulers that are being described in Romans 13, they say. Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. We are doing what is good. We're not getting praise from Charles V. For it is a minister of, of God to, to you for good. Well, he must not be a minister of God because he's not satisfying this description. But if you do what is evil, it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. But we're not doing evil, and he's administering wrath on us. So Romans 13 must not be talking about, about Charles. We pay taxes, for the rulers are servants of God. But Charles V isn't a servant of God. He's the Antichrist. He poses as a servant of God. He stands in the temple of God and erects an abomination, they say. So he's not a servant of God. He is not devoting himself to this very thing, namely punishing the wicked and rewarding the good. So now we see uh, their argument is this means that you identify rulers by looking at their substantive commitment to the good. You, you look and see how committed they are to the good, okay? And you can ask different questions like they do. Do they have to be perfectly good? No, they say. They don't have to be perfectly good. If they, if they are prey to the ordinary errors that all mankind makes, that's not a reason to resist them. That's not a reason to say they're not Roma, Romans 13 rulers. 
how good do they have to be? Mostly good, 51% of the time. Sub substantively good, you know, like 28, 30% of the time they have to be good. Relatively good, they could be 2% of the good, but if the other guy is 0% of the good, then it's better than nothing. These are, these are all important questions that they don't get into. They give us that fourfold dichotomy where they say, if, if it's an error that's common to all mankind, that doesn't count. This is a, a remedy for really serious situations. Real tyrants, tyrants forcing you to do something. That's the only time you have to resist. And of course, the situation of, of the Antichrist. So everyone understand their, their theory. This is their interpretation of Romans 13. This portion of Romans 13 that seems to say there is a, an independent judgment we can make where we recognize someone as a ruler and we have the duty, they say, don't read that, don't read that and set your mind. Keep reading here and where it describes the ruler, those are the only rulers who are ordinances of God. Everybody else is an ordinance of Satan. The, the, the duty to obey that's set up in Romans 13 only applies to people who are good. They're, they're doing the work of a magistrate, punishing the wicked, rewarding the good. How good do they have to be? Well, that's what we find out in those, those four categories that they, they erect, okay? But they do make use of this portion of Romans 13 in that they, they think that God is promising that he will give us people to obey. He, they think that this constitutes a, a, a promise, a statement about the, the nature of things. God has established magistrates for us to obey. It's, it's like this. If you were looking around your church and you were trying to find a, a, a pastor, a preacher, and you just said, well, I guess there aren't any. We're just going to do without elders. We're going to do without pastors. We're going to do without people who have this important gift of the Spirit. They would say, you're wrong. Keep looking. Don't give up on God. God has promised us these things. God has promised us people with these gifts. So too, the gifts that God has promised us, that there will be magistrates who are his ordinance. We, we never find ourselves in an anarchic situation where there are no rulers whatsoever. Well, sometimes the ruler we think is the ruler isn't acting justly. What about then? Well, then the, the person you should look to is the inferior magistrate, his equal, his superior, who is acting justly in these ways. So distinguish the, the, what we might call a Ciceronian reading of Romans 13 from the Magdeburgian reading of Romans 13. There were Ciceronian Christians who had their own reading of Romans 13. And I don't want you to confuse what the Magdeburgians say with what the Ciceronians said. The, the Ciceronian reading of Romans 13 would be to say, you're right, uh, rulers are God's ordinance if and only if they punish the wicked and reward the good. But as soon as we find them not doing that, all bets are off. We have no duty of obligation. We can proceed. They're just people we can kill. They're, once, once that's done, the government is over. We, we, at that point, when the king is, is unjust, there are no magistrates. We're done. There's no ordinance of God. That's the, the Ciceronian reading. It just emphasizes the second half negative portion uh, of their interpretation. That if somebody is unjust, he can't be a ruler. Therefore, he can be resisted. Without considering what the Magdeburgians consider, which is, did God promise us that there would be people for us to follow? Did God promise us that there would be governments that commanded our, our authority, um, uh, commanded authority, and, and attention. One thing that happens in the, in the history of the interpretation of this, of this argument is uh, people began to develop natural justifications for obeying rulers beyond Romans 13. So in response to the, the Ciceronian argument, that, hey, Romans 13 ends when rulers are, are unjust. Uh, there were a lot of scholars, most famously, for example, Hobbes, 
who would say, sure, yeah, you no longer have a duty in conscience to obey, but it might be prudent to obey. We might have a moral obligation to obey nonetheless out of political prudence because it's always better to have an unjust king than no king, right? So one response to this kind of argument is uh, of the Ciceronians is to, is to develop natural theories of, of political obedience. I thought I just might, might add that uh, for you. It's also important that you distinguish the, the Magdeburgian reading of, of Romans from a, what, a defeasibility argument. They're going to make a defeasibility argument, but this isn't it. The, a defeasibility argument is an argument that says there's a principle, and it's a true principle, but certain principles are defeasible. That is to say they have important exceptions in light of a higher principle. So, for example, we might say what Romans 13 says is that you have a duty to obey rulers, but of course there must be some exceptions to that in light of higher principles. And the argument would proceed something like what Jesus said uh, in Matthew 12. Uh, the Pharisees see the disciples gathering grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus answered, haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent. Um, Jesus repeatedly in his ministry, when challenged about whether or not the, the disciples are violating the command to rest on the Sabbath, says basically, I understand what you're, what you're thinking. In ordinary situations, this would be a violation of the command not to work on the Sabbath. But the command not to work on the Sabbath is defeasible. It gives way in light of a higher principle. Here's another, another example. He's challenged about the, about the Sabbath. He says, because Moses gave you a command for circumcision, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. If a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, circumcised within eight days, what if it falls on the Sabbath? Why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by appearances and make a right judgment. Or more succinctly, what's, it lawf what's lawful to do on the Sabbath? To do good or evil, to save a life or to kill. So this is a classic kind of defeasibility. You say, uh, uh, you shouldn't do this, whatever it is. And you say, well, what if I have to do it to save a life? You shouldn't work on the Sabbath. What if I have to work on the Sabbath to save a life? This is exactly what came up in Maccabees. You shouldn't work on the Sabbath. What if I have to work killing Greeks on the Sabbath? Right? In general, you can't fight on the Sabbath. But what if I'm attacked on the Sabbath? Can I defend my life? Can I defend my fortress? Uh, the argument is, sure you can. That the, the principle of, of not working on the Sabbath is defeased in that, in that circumstance. Notice that's not what the, the pastors of Magdeburg are arguing first with respect to uh, the duty in Romans 13. The duty in Romans 13 is for you to submit to the authorities. There's no exception. There's, there's no suggestion that there are, are any exceptions to this rule whatsoever. Submit to the authorities. So one argument that you could make is, is to say, yeah, when it says submit to the authorities, it doesn't mean, it shouldn't be interpreted to mean under any circumstance whatsoever, no matter what's going on. What if the, the authority tells you to kill Israelite babies? Should you submit to the authorities? Of course not. What if, what if the, uh, the authorities tell you to worship an idol? Should you submit to the authorities? Of course not. That's a, a defeasibility argument, that where God has commanded something contrary, that we should read following God's command and submit to the authorities subject to all of your other duties, some of which are higher, to obey God and follow his word. That's not this argument. It's an interesting argument. They're going to make arguments like that with respect to self-defense and defense of others in a second next, next week, but that's not the argument they're making right now. 
The argument they're making right now is, we believe in God's political provision. We believe that Romans 13 is, a, is fundamentally a teaching about God's provision. What God has called us to do is have faith in his institution of authorities. The, the first response we have to the question of, of tyrants is, will we believe in God's provision? And they say, yeah, we do believe in God's provision. We're not suggesting that anybody can, can suddenly revolt just because they want to. What we're suggesting is precisely that we have more faith in God's provision than those who would give in to tyrants. We have more faith because God wants good for us. Because God wants good for us, the natural thing to do is look around and see who is God raised up? Who is God appointed as a good magistrate who punishes wickedness? To whom has God called and given the duty to punish this superior magistrate? His superior? His equal? An inferior? And looking around at Magdeburg, what they said to people is, you, my friend, the, the mayor of Magdeburg. This is like if you talk to the mayor of Pohong. There's a tyrant who's surrounded Pohong, and the, the tyrant is saying, you know, you must set up false religion in Pohong. And you go to the mayor of Pohong and you go, look, God puts you here at this time in this place, and he has given you authority in Pohong. You have the right to resist somebody who wants to force false religion on the people. And they say, they say, but God says submit to authorities. They say, we are submitting to authorities. We're submitting to the authorities that God has raised up. This is not an argument that the, the principle of submission is limited or defeased because of a, a, a particular situation. It's an argument that you are fully fulfilling that position. You are submitting to the authorities. The unjust rulers are no longer authorities. Uh, the people who are just are the authorities, and you're submitting to them. Don't mistake that for a, an argument about defeasibility. That's coming up. This is an argument that says we're trusting in what God has done. So we're going to see more of this uh, next week. We're going to see some arguments about defeasibility. But in your reading today, you, you got a little bit of it when they, they compared this situation to the situation in Maccabees with Antiochus and the people who wouldn't fight on the Sabbath day. We're going to see some more of these arguments and some more comparison with Maccabees uh, next, next week. One other important point that, that comes out of, out of this uh, argument. They maintain that every magistrate from the, the highest magistrate to the lowest magistrate, has a direct relationship to God. In human terms, you might think, look, uh, the, the president of Korea appoints the, the minister of justice, the minister of justice appoints the prosecutor, the prosecutor appoints sub-prosecutors, they appoint sub-sub-prosecutors all the way down. The, uh, the government of Korea appoints the judges, Judges appoint other judges, dun, 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 dun. that everything is in a hierarchy, that the only people who is, are really magistrates are the top guys. But the, the scriptures teach us otherwise. Uh, the scriptures teach us otherwise in, in Peter, where they say that, that we should obey all the rulers from the highest to the lower governors because all of them are appointed by, by God. Uh, we also get some of this in, in different, different passages like... Uh, this one. In the, the Old Testament, when the judges, lower judges, below Moses are being described, they are described not as having their duty to man. Uh, Moses doesn't say to them, do what you do because otherwise I'll be mad at you. He says, what you're doing, the judgment that you give, its belonging is to God. It comes from God. Which, which you are acting out, even though you are a sub-judge appointed by me. And remember, there were many, many, many levels of, of judges. There was, there was Moses, uh, and then there were judges over uh, uh, different groups of people, thousands, hundreds, tens. The, the judges were arranged in, in a hierarchy, and there was a way to appeal to, to Moses for difficult cases. 
Don't be afraid of any man because the judgment that you give belongs to God. You're not supposed to do what your superior tells you to do. You're not supposed to judge according to what Moses thinks you should do. Your accountability in any act of judgment is directly to God. When Joseph had commissioned the judges, he put it to them in a, a similar way. He said, consider carefully what you do, because you're not judging for man. You're judging for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. The, the lowest magistrate, the lowest level magistrate has a duty to do what's right, not to respect man, to do what's right in relation not to his superior, but in relation to God. This is a, a basic aspect of this theory of the lesser magistrates. The response to the theory of the lesser magistrates was, well, if I'm king, I can tell the judges what to do. If I'm king, I can tell any inferior magistrate what to do. If I'm king, I can remove any inferior magistrate. And this is precisely what they denied. And now they deny it with the full force of Romans 13. They say, what Romans 13 says is, not that the king determines the political order, but that God has instituted the political order. Now, God used you, king, to appoint these magistrates. But once they become magistrates, they are as much in relationship to God as you are. The king wants to say, I'm the only one. I who have the, the top crown, I'm the only one who's an institution of God. But they say, that's not what it says. It says all these rulers are institutions of God. You, king, are an important part of that. You had the, the right and the authority to appoint who you will. But once you've done that under God's direction, now all of them are institutions of God. And if you pull yourself out of the institution of God, if you show yourself not to be part of the institution of God by your injustice, all of those people you appointed are still part of the institution of God. All right, so there are some questions, um, and I'll answer those questions now. One of the questions that, that, that I got was, who can resist the, the lower magistrates? Could the po common people resist them? This is a great question. Who are the superior and legislative magistrates in democracies today? Is how I was going to address this, this question with you today. Um, Clearly, we have lesser magistrates. You have officials under national presidents, legislatures, judiciaries. So one view would be that the, the lesser magistrates below them are the citizens and the people. The citizens and people in a democracy are themselves lesser magistrates. And this is a theory in the 17th century that's going to get a lot of traction. It's the theory of popular sovereignty, and the idea will be God never leaves us without a magistrate, not just because he's surrounded uh, bad magistrates with lesser magistrates and superior magistrates, but because you can never have a state without a people. And that people is the magistrate of final resort. Now, in one sense, as I note up here, the citizens and the people are actually superior magistrates. So there are two arguments you can offer. One is the people, citizens are lesser magistrates. The other is that the citizens, particularly acting together, are actually superior magistrates. That when they intervene, they don't have to wait for these occasions to intervene. They can intervene directly because they're the superior magistrate of, of the people. And their institution is just as much a divine act as that of, of the king. Notice, though, uh, there's a certain tension between the theory of democracy that we have and this, this idea. Uh, we tend to think of our democratic governments as representative. That is to say, what the, 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 the representative in Congress should be doing is manifesting my will. That we, we say that uh, democracies are superior because the people are ruling themselves. But uh, congressmen, on this theory, don't represent themselves. They're institutions of God. 
their obligation is to punish the wicked and to uphold the good in relation to God. There's no way that you can describe the duty of a legislator, of a president, of a judge in relationship to the people alone. Because our whole right of resistance, our whole ability to topple unjust rulers comes from the fact that they stand in a direct relationship to God. So we can hold this view. We could say the people are a lesser magistrate. Uh, we could say the people themselves act as sort of a, a magistrate of last resort, either as a superior or as an inferior. But to do that, you have to reject a, a certain very popular theory of government today, which is that it gains its legitimacy because the people are ruling themselves. No, democratic officials don't rule with the will of the people. They are in direct relationship to God. They are an institution to God. They have to fulfill the charter of God. And if they don't do what God wants them to do, punish the wicked and affirm the good, then they're wicked magistrates. No matter how representative they are of the, of the people, God warns them and says, don't be mistaken in what you do. You have to represent me and not whatever other men you want to, to represent. So this is a very important argument. Uh, one of you asked a question about how does this relate to our teaching last semester about the martyrs. This is a very important argument for understanding how a theory of resistance could be based on faith and confidence in God's providence. The, the similarity here is the, the, the pastors of Magdeburg have said, look, we don't know if we're going to win. We don't know if we're going to lose. We're surrounded by the largest army in the world. We're surrounded by the largest empire in the world. We're one little city. What we do know, mayor of Magdeburg, is that we have faith in God's political provision. He's raised you up. He's given you understanding of his will. He's given you a confidence to fight against false religion being imposed upon us. You have to act in relationship to God, even if it means your destruction, our destruction, you have to stand up against the superior magistrate in confidence in God's provision. The provision here of, of God is a temporal political provision. The confidence of the martyr is in God's eternal provision. But it arises from the same spirit in this sense. Both of these views, both of martyrdom and of resistance, are grounded in faith in God's provision. And this distinguishes it from the Ciceronian ancient theory, and it distinguishes it from modern revolutionary theories of resistance as well. But be careful. If you like this theory of, of resistance, which I, I obviously like it, but if you like this theory of resistance, be careful because it necessarily changes the way you view democracies. Every democratic official, once he becomes elected, once he becomes a magistrate, stands directly before God doing what he wants to do. This is his charter to resist injustice, but it's also a, a declaration of a certain kind of separation from simply representing your views. Next week, we'll, we'll take up some of their arguments about defeasibility, the way in which not only in faith uh, can we, we follow God in this way, but even if we did have a duty of obedience to the rulers, it wouldn't include certain extreme situations like the one that they're facing today. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of the people of Magdeburg who faced with overwhelming odds, put their faith in you rather than their own calculations, who trusted in you rather than being appalled and fearful by the strength of men. Our Father in heaven, we know this for sure, that in all of our lives we should follow you completely, not fearing man, but trusting in you. Help us to do this, Lord, with wisdom and truth. In Jesus' name we pray.